here now. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you where you can actually find the details for the final paper. So what you're going to do is you're going to come over to Canvas. And the way you're going to find the details for the final paper is you're going to come up here to the course page. And you're going to scroll down to this help for your final paper. So there's four documents. And each one of these documents is something different to help you out with this final paper. Okay, so the first document, which is, is the research paper directions, you should probably just download all of these. I, I would suggest printing them out because I personally like actually print paper. I'm not a huge fan of reading stuff off of the computer, but again, you know, that's your decision. So this is the research paper direction. So this just shows you, you know, just kind of like a general outline of what you all should be doing, what's kind of expected out of you. Um, the next document is the rubric that I'll be using for the final paper. So this tells you, you know, like the statement of problem, how much is that worth, your hypothesis, how much is that worth, literature review, and so on. So all the things that are outlined here, this tells you how much each thing is worth. Okay. Now this next document, getting your stats from SPSS, this is a document that shows you how to do all the procedures that you're going to have to do in SPSS for your final paper. Okay, and it walks you through step by step what you need to do. So how to create, you know, statistics for your two variables. Um, how to create a frequency distribution for your two variables. How to create graphs how to create cross tabs, how to calculate the measures of association, and so on and so forth. So that's what you need that for. Then this last document is an example paper. So if you follow this example paper, it's a pretty good, I mean, it was actually written by a student, so it's not a perfect paper, but it's a pretty good example of what it is that I'm expecting for this final paper. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, oh, this is just crazy. Look how much this is. I mean, yes, yeah, close to like something like nine pages, but I wouldn't be overly concerned about page length because they like said some of the stuff is just, you know, graphs, tables, you know, that's like up a whole page. There's a works cited page, that's one page. There's a reference page, this one page, it's actually not quite that long. Only a couple pages of writing, and a lot of the writing is just reporting what's actually in these tables and graphs and in the cross tabs and you know the measures of association, chi square, things like that. Okay, so that's what those four documents are for. Let's take a look at this research paper document. So the research change just do a little bit. Okay, so the research paper, you can kind of think about this final paper as um, currently this uh, semester it's an extra credit final paper. You kind of think about this final paper as a kind of like a practice or like a mini research paper. So like I said, this statistics course is kind of like an applied statistical research course. So kind of think about this as kind of like a practice like journal article that you might, might be writing that you might be submitting, okay? So most quantitative research papers follow pretty much the exact same format. And so this is the format that you'll be following. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna have a, obviously a title page and stuff like that. So if you look at the example page, example people, there's a title page. Um, so it has a title, student's name, obviously you're going to put my name and the date and so on and so forth. You go and make sure that you're following APA format as well. Um, there's two formats that I'll accept, APA and ASA, just use one of those. APA is standard, ASA, American Sociological Association is something specific to sociology. And it's pretty much the same thing as APA, so if you follow APA, you're pretty much good. Okay? So the research paper, like I said, you can think about it as a kind of like a practice, uh, you know, academic journal article. You're going to start off with a title page. Then you're going to go into a statement of problem. 
Okay, so what are you doing with the statement of problem? Um, you're essentially telling me well, what it is that you're going to be looking at with your final paper and why I should care. Okay, because uh, you never want to start off a paper and like, yeah, I'm going to look at this, yada, 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 and then jump into the actual paper. You want to start off with what the paper is about, why it's interesting, why you're looking at a significant social problem that I personally as a reader should care about. Okay, um, a good way to do this is, you know, find some type of like maybe article or news, you know, clipping that, sh you know, citation that shows that this is a real significant problem within our society. So if you're thinking about the relationship between, I don't know, religion and gun control, you might want to take a, you know, citation of, from the New York Times about a recent mass shooting. I'm sure there shouldn't be any problem finding one of those because they happen all the time nowadays. Okay? Um, so find something, some type of like, you know, attention grabbing headline from one of the news. So I said, tell me about what it is that you're looking at and why I should consider this to be important. So if you look at this student, um, the student is looking at the relationship between religious service and so or people attending religious services and whether or not uh, that influences people's view on the death penalty, whether or not they're pro um, capital punishment or whether or not they're against capital punishment. So, so then talk about, okay, the vast majority of religions consider more murder or capital punishment to be a crime. Yada, 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 cites the Bible. And then, again, basically what they're doing, what he's doing in this first chapter, or in this first uh, paragraph, is telling you what he's looking at and why I should care. Okay. Now, oh, and another thing that you want to do is you actually want to have actual headers as well. And I know you've been told, you know, throughout your entire academic career, never write in first person. When you're writing a research paper, you actually write in first person. So you write, well, I did this, and this is what I'm looking at, and these are my two variables. So don't worry about trying to write this in third person. That that's, doesn't matter. Okay. So then you're going to have a heading for a uh, review of the literature and development of the hypothesis. Because typically what you do when you write a research paper, you start off, you talk about what it is that you're looking for, looking at. And then you do a, what we refer to as the literature review. So with a literature review, if you're doing a real literature review, you would go look at peer-reviewed academic journals, um, look at them typically within the past decade, look at the research that's been done in the field in the past decade, look at what other experts have said about the relationship between the two variables that you're looking at, and then think about how it is that you can expand on the studies that are already out there, because there's no point really doing the exact same thing but maybe there's like a control variable that a, another professor missed, or maybe that, you know, this maybe this professor looked at this one theory from this one angle, and then you want to apply it to this other to a different institution or something like that, right? So what you'd want to do is you'd want to go do a literature review of what other professors in the field have said about the relationship between the two variables, and where you're going to find the literature for your topic. Okay, ideally, what you want to do is you want to come over to College of Deserts website, and I come over here, click on library. Now you're going to come over here to this library database. Um, if you're doing this from your home, which you probably are during these times, um, you're going to come over here and you have to enter, I think your username and your password. And then you'll get access. So ideally, you probably just want to go to Edsco host. And then academic search complete is, again, probably ideal here. And let's just say I want to look at the relationship between social class and health. And then it'll pull up a bunch of articles. Some of these don't seem to be in English, so uh, I, I could narrow my search. Like I said, ideally, you would want to do a uh, search for research done in the past decade. Um, it doesn't have to be in the past decade, but you don't want to go back 20 years or anything like that. Like I said, ideally, you'd want to do academic journals, scholarly peer review, which means that they're high quality, and then you also want full text articles. For whatever reason, it just altered my publication date, so I'm just going to get it back to 2010. 
And I am assuming that it's only going to show me articles written from 2010 and uh, later. Okay. So now I have a bunch of peer reviewed academic journals. Uh, I can actually access the full text now. And uh, I can see whether or not any of these articles really apply to what it is that I'm looking for. So let's just say waiting time at health facilities and social class evidence from the Indian caste system. That's from India that might be applicable, maybe not. Let's take a look at this. Kill or cure, different types of social class, identification, amplify, and buffer, the relation between social class and mental health. That might be something that I'm interested in, you know, so I can just kind of look at the titles, see if I might want to use this in my literature review. Or I could just, uh, if I see something that kind of looks like it might be applicable to what I'm looking at, and I'll come over here, I'll click on this, and this will give me an abstract. Now, what is an abstract? An abstract is a really short summary of an article. So each one of these articles are going to be somewhere between 15 and 30, pa 15 and 30 pages long. And you don't want to spend third, you know, like an hour reading a 30-page article to find out at the end that it's not really applicable to what it is that you're looking at. So an abstract is a quick summary of the article to see just right off the bat whether or not this is going to be applicable for what you're looking at. So waiting time, emergency medical care in developed countries, yada, yada, yada. This might be something that I'm actually interested in. So this might be something that I actually want to read. So I can download this PDF. And I can, again, read this article, and I might want to cite this article in my literature review. If I do want to cite it, it's pretty cool what EBSCO host has. If you come over here to the right, here you can see the cite document. Let's click on it. And it'll actually give you APA format and a bunch of other types of formats that I've literally never even seen before. Well, I didn't Google what that is. But then you can just go ahead and take this, copy, and paste this, and then you can literally just jump it into your reference page. Right? So that's what you're going to be doing for your literature review. So you really only need two citations. Okay? Two citations looking at you know, what other professors have said about the relationship between the two variables that you're looking at. Now, let's just say that you think that you're using some really obscure, really weird um, you know, topic, and that you're not going to be able to find any research that's been done on your topic. Um, you might not be able to do that, but I promise you the librarians can, okay? So whatever you think that you're studying that you think is unique and different, there's you know, a little bit over you know, 4.5 billion people in the world. Somebody's looked at something that you might be interested in. So if you're like looking through these databases and you can't find anything that's been done before, um, you can come over to this library website and you can chat with a librarian, and they will, so you can go on to this, ask the librarian, and then they'll provide you with help, and then they can, like I said, if you can't find the information or find citations, they can find them for you. Okay. Uh, when I was in grad school, I'd be at the library all the time, and things that would take me hours, I'd look up stuff for hours, they'd find stuff in like five minutes for me. Okay. So you just want two citations, in the literature review, we're going to use parenthetical citation. So you're going to need the name, the year the article was published, and then obviously the page number. And then obviously those citations are going to be linked to the reference page in the back of the, in the, back of the paper. So if you look, student cites Berg, 36, and it doesn't put the year in Johnson, so it doesn't do parenthetical citation the proper way, but then cites in the reference page, Johnson and Berg. Another thing about the student, um, so not using APA format, they should have reference here, and then obviously this should be alphabetized. Again, this was written by a student again. So, but that's essentially what I'm looking for in the literature review, just find two citations, Use parenthetical citation and say what those professors have said about the relationship between the two variables that you're looking at. Now, after you write a literature review, um, you are then going to write your research hypothesis. Okay? 
Now, I think I said this already, the literature review, it is designed for the purpose of uh, helping you to formulate your hypothesis. So you're going to see what other professors have said about the topic, and then you're going to think about one way that you're going to expand upon that research. Technically, that's how you do an actual literature review. Don't worry about all that. Just state your hypothesis. And you should have your hypothesis from, I think, week three or week four. You all wrote a hypothesis. Okay. So then after you do your literature review, right at the end of the literature review, you're going to say my research hypothesis, H1, yada, yada, yada. So this student says the more often individuals attend religious service, the less likely they are to favor the death penalty. And then you're going to put the no hypothesis, my no hypothesis, H0. Attending religious services has no effect on view of death penalty. Okay. Um, so you write your research, you write your no, so write your literature review, then your research, and then your no hypothesis right after. Okay. Now, after you write your research hypothesis and then your no hypothesis, you've already done your literature review. After that, you're going to write the method section. Okay. Now, in the method section, what you're doing with the method section is you're describing the sample and you're describing the data that you are using for your research study. Now, like I said, if you're doing a real research study, the reason why you'd want to write a method section is because you want to be able to give any other professor who may have read your work the ability to do a replication study. So let's just say that I make the argument that crack cures cancer. Okay, and then you as a researcher, you read this article, somehow it gets published in an academic journal. You read this and you're like, this is complete crap. What type of data did this professor use? So you look at it and you're like, well, I want to redo the study because I doubt the validity and I doubt the reliability of this study. So you want to give any other professor the ability to replicate your results, okay? And if your results are valid, then we should be able to test the exact same variables with the exact same data and see the exact same results. If we test the exact same data with the exact same variables and we don't see the exact same results, then we know that that study, there was some type of like flaw in the methodology, you know, and the way you uh, did something with the data, you altered it in some way. Um, so you want to give people the ability to do a replication study just to confirm the validity and the reliability of your study. Now, like I said, you're not going to get this published in an academic journal. So again, I, this is just practice. So just put down, you know, describe the data a little bit, describe the general social survey, um, describe the variables that you're using, both your independent and your dependent variable. So if you look what this student did for the methods, again, he used the 2010 General Social Survey, discussed the General Social Survey a little bit, random sample of, you know, Americans, um, talked about the two variables. I think the independent variable was how often a respondent attends with the services, and then put down the possible responses for those variables. Never, less than once a year, once a year, so on and so forth. And talking about the dependent variable was, does the respondent favor, favor or oppose the death penalty? And then the two responses are favor or oppose, right? And then talked about how the student would be using the chi-square test because the variables are, the dependent variable is nominal and then the independent variable is ordinal. So ideally the chi-square test would be best for that, okay? Um, now, if you wanted to, you could use the t-test if you wanted to. You could do regression. I mean, you haven't learned about regression yet. You really haven't even learned how to do the chi-square test yet. But ideally, you're just going to use the chi-square test, and you're just going to look at the measures of association for this final paper. Because, just because I think it's a little bit easier uh, for most students to uh, do. Okay, so then you're going to get into the findings section. So if you look at the rubric, you know, statement problem worth 10 points, hypothesis, you should have already written it, worth 10 points, the literature review is worth uh, 15 points. Um, so where the vast majority of the points are going to be 
it's going to be in the fighting section. So there's 30 points possible in the fighting section. Five points in the method section, you know, you have five points for the title page, five points for uh, uh, the reference page, 10 points for the conclusion, 10 points for the discussion. This is where most students mess up is in the finding section. So you want to make sure that you're hitting all these points. Students always ask me, you know, what is the page length? What is the minimum page length? What is the maximum page length? I tell students all the time, there's no minimum, there's no maximum. If you're um, writing this paper and it's two pages long, um, you can do that. I can't imagine your paper is going to be too good. Um, it's probably going to be pretty horrible, so you're not going to get a very good grade. Um, and then there's just really no point writing 20 pages. The reason why I don't specify page length is because I've had a lot of students, you know, write 10 pages, and it's just 10 pages is just the worst you know, stuff you've ever seen, you know. Uh, they'll use 25 point font, you know, with Arial, you know, spacing it out like two and a half. You know, have two inch margins all around the paper. They're hitting the enter button three times in between paragraph breaks and talking about, oh, I got the 10 pages. So, yeah, it was 10 pages of crap and you know it, right? I don't care about page length. I care more about substance and content. So this is what we're looking for with this um, final paper. Okay. Um, so you're going to be going to the finding section and look up uh, measures. Uh, for the findings, we're going to be looking for a couple things. For both variables, we're going to be looking for the measures of central tendency. Okay. We're going to be looking for the measures of dispersion or variation. Okay. We're going to be looking for the cross tab for those two variables. Okay, we're going to be looking for the uh, measures of association or the measures of correlation. Again, a topic that we haven't specifically discussed yet so far. Um, we're going to be looking at the percentages for the cross tabs. So it's quite a bit, and I think it's best to kind of like look at the example paper here. So what the student did is took the first variable, uh, specified that the first variable is ordinal, so let me know that's an ordinal level variable. Um, reported the marginals, well, what are the marginals? They are the valid percents for each category, so 23.1% you know, of the sample said that they never go to church, so then starts reporting the marginals, 23% said never, 7% said less than once a year, so you're going to start reporting the marginals for each category of the variable. Okay, then after did, uh, the student did that, then they reported both the measure of central tendency. Because it's an ordinal level variable, the student reported median for this variable, and then the median was once a month. Um, the student actually didn't put the, as far as I can see, did not put the actual statistics. So you should also put the statistics up here as well for full credit. And so you was getting your stats from SPSS. This document shows you how to calculate the statistics. So we should see the, this chart to see, you know, which um, category is the median, which category is the range, which category is, you know, this and that. So that's one thing that the student missed there. Um, but again, the median, which is the right measure of central tendency for ordinal level data, I'm assuming the student calculated, was once a month. Um, and then the range is more than once a week to never. So the range is the highest category subtracted by the lowest category. So it's from here to here. So the student reported those right. And then created both the frequency distribution and then the graph for that. Again, this document will show you how to create these tables and then these graphs. So after the student did that for the first variable, pretty much repeats it for the second variable. So the second variable is also ordinal. The second variable actually isn't ordinal, it's nominal. Okay. And then again, the student reports the marginals in the sense that the valid percents, 7.5%. Percent said that they favor the death penalty. 32.5% say that they oppose, so to report that. The mode is the ideal measure of central tendency for nominal level data, so we got that right. Probably just accidentally put ordinal and should have put nominal. 
And then the IQV is 0.877. So the IQV is the index of qualitative variation, which you would need to hand calculate because SPSS does not provide that. You learn the hand calculations through chapter four. Okay. And uh, so the student reported the IQV, which is the right measure of dispersion or variation for nominal level data. Um, then put the frequency distribution and then the graph. Reported the percents for the graphs, not the frequencies. Then after did that for both variables, then came over here and created a cross tab. Now this cross tab um, did a pretty good job of fitting a cross tab on the actual paper, even though it's a little hard to read it in, in that sense. Yeah. Now what the student does is they do an analysis of this cross tab to see whether or not the independent variable influences the dependent variable anyways. I'm going to actually download this paper so I can see a little bit more in depth. Okay, so we should be able to see it a little bit more in depth now. So we can actually read this cross tab. So when you look at this cross tab, the student makes the argument that people who I'm assuming go to church are more likely to oppose the death penalty. Okay, so when you look at people who go more than once a week, the percentage of people who oppose the death penalty is 38%. And that's higher than people who um, never go, which is 31%. Is there a relationship here? Yeah, but it doesn't really seem all that large, right? If you're just looking at the percentages here. Now, one problem that the student uh, had is that the student calculated the percentages for the rows when the student should have just calculated the percentages for the column, which makes this cross tab too big, and then you have these percentages over here for the rows. The student should have, shouldn't have done that, should have just done it for the, for, for the columns because this is just making uh, the table a lot harder to read, a little bit more confusing, okay? Um, so then here, the student tries to make an argument about how there is a relationship, um, and unfortunately, uses the wrong percentages here. Um, because if you look at the percentages for the dependent variable, not for the independent variable. Now, after uh, the student did that, then the student calculates the chi-square. Um, this shows that pretty much what you can just kind of tell by looking at the percentages. That there's really not much of a relationship between how often a person attends religious services and whether or not they support uh, the death penalty. Okay. The reason why I know that it's not statistically significant is because the significance level is 0 0.107. If you remember what we discussed uh, two weeks ago with the t-test, is that you want your significance level or your p-value to be, to be either below the 0 0.05, the 0 0.01, or the 0 0.001 alpha level. And of course, this significance of 0 0.107 is higher than all of them. So we know that this is not statistically significant and that there doesn't appear to be a real relationship between how often a person attends religious services and whether or not they favor or oppose the death penalty. Okay. The other thing is, like I said, this is something that we're going to study next week, which is the measure of association. If you look at the value of gamma, gamma is 0 0.091. And what gamma tells us is that it's actually an extremely, I mean, I guess you could say it's an extremely weak relationship. It's kind of telling us that there's not really much of a relationship at all. That is, gamma tells us the strength of the relationship, and chi-square tells us whether or not it's statistically significant, and it's uh, not statistically significant, and there seems to be like pretty much no real relationship between the two variables whatsoever. Okay. So the student, of course, uh, reports gamma 0 0.091, which indicates an extremely weak, practically no relationship whatsoever. Then the chi-square, um, also tells us that, again, the significance level is above 0 0.05. So essentially what we do is we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so we have no real 
evidence for our research hypothesis in this example. Okay. And then, so what you do is you report the results. Like I said, a couple of things that you need to report for the um, finding section. Like I said, the measure of tendency, measure of dispersion, what that student did, uh, and got for the most part the right ones, create the cross tab, calculate the percentages for the cross tabs, calculate the measure of correlation, use gamma in this situation, how that's an extremely weak relationship between the two variables. Then in the discussion section, what you're going to kind of do is you're going to talk about, you know, what you found, okay, and how your paper can be improved, how your studies have, 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 can be improved. So what's the status of your hypothesis? Do you reject? Do you fail to reject? What should other researchers look for in the future? And what are some of the limitations of your own personal study? Okay. And then in the, in the conclusion, what you're going to do is you're going to kind of like restate all the main points of the article. Why do you want to restate all the main points? Because if you're like anybody, any other student I've ever ran into, in addition to myself, one other student, if you're re reading a lot of academic journal articles, in all likelihood, you're really reading two parts of it. You're reading the introduction, you're reading the conclusion, and you might skim the rest of the paper, right? So the conclusion a lot of times is the only part that people are actually looking at. So because of that, you want to restate all the major important parts of uh, your paper so that in case somebody doesn't read the whole thing, which there's no real reason to think that anybody would read the whole thing, um, they know what the general gist of that paper was about, okay? Now, after you write the discussion and conclusion, you are going to, again, have a reference page, reference not work cited, have the citations alphabetized, not obviously what you see here, and make sure you're using APA format. And that's kind of what you're, uh, that's kind of what we're looking for for the final paper. Again, follow this format. There are various mistakes with this final paper. I don't expect anybody to be a stats expert. I expect you all to give good effort, try your best, follow this format. And, you know, I always, you know, respond to emails and help students out if they need any, if they have any questions and need help, you know, deciding what measure of central tendency, what measure of dispersion, yada, 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 they should be using for this stuff. Okay. Having said that, I mean, that's the general gist of it. Oh, yeah, and also, um, this right here, once you get to the reference page, in the research paper directions, um, kind of shows you how to do APA citation, APA format in your reference page for book, a journal article, a newspaper, magazine, you know, uh, pretty much any type of document that you can think of. And if you can't find out how to cite whatever it is that you're trying to cite here, then you probably shouldn't be citing it. Um, but in case you ever do run into that situation, you could also go to Purdue OWL. What is Purdue OWL? Purdue OWL is an online writing lab ran out of Purdue University, and it will show you the different citation, how to cite for APA, MLA, and all the major citation formats. So you just come over here, and if you can't find out how to cite something, you can usually find the citation how to cite it here, okay? Yeah, they have PowerPoint, sample paper, table of figures, um, in-text citations, footnotes, endnotes. Yeah, so they even have quite a bit of information on how to cite and APA formatting and stuff like that, how to write an abstract. Um, anybody have any questions about that final paper? What's expected of you? Like I said, some of the stuff we haven't even gone over yet. So if you're like, I don't know what chi square is, I don't know what gamma is, I don't know what the measures of association are. Um, again, we're not done with the class yet. By the time we're done, you should at least have some exposure to that stuff. Anybody have any questions about uh, the final paper? Like I said, I'm going to send this to everybody. Well, some of the other classes. So. You know, you might have some question that somebody else is watching this recording. It's like, oh, what, what uh, they, they have a question that they're kind of hoping somebody asks.
I don't yet, but I usually get the questions as I go along and I'm doing it. But um, that was very helpful. So thank you. Okay. And like I said, if you run into any issues where you're not understanding it, just shoot me an email and I'll try to respond as fast as I can. Okay, thank you. It looks it looks complicated, but I'm hoping once um, I start and having that outline to follow, it, it will kind of help move it along. Well, like I said, a lot of this stuff, like I said, it's, uh, you know, here, and you're just kind of reporting this stuff, like I said, chi-square. This didn't just report it to chi-square. It didn't come up with anything, right? Just created the cross tabs. And SPSS does that for you. Yeah, the student didn't create any of this stuff, SPSS creates this stuff, and then the student just reported it. So a lot of the stuff is just going to be you reporting what's here. So it's actually um, not even all that difficult in the, in the sense of like, all you kind of do, some, do sometimes is just look at, you know, like I said, this is what the frequency distribution tells me. Okay, so 23% of the sample said never. Okay, well, I'm just going to write 23% of the sample said never and so on, right? You know, the student didn't create these frequency distributions, SPSS created all this stuff. The student didn't create the cross tab, SPSS created all this stuff. You know, the students just reporting the chi square. So, in that sense, again, a lot of this stuff is just reporting, you know, what SPSS provides you. So, like you said, there is some writing, but it's not extremely difficult. Right. Uh, some of those. Um charts look like they came straight from SPSS. Did they copy and paste? Yeah, or so well, that's, actually, that's actually a good question. So yes, so let's just say that I wanted to pull, like I said in the lecture, I, I gave an example of these charts. You say I wanted to pull them, what I do is I copy, and then I just go to a Word document. I'm just gonna create a new Word document. And I can just, uh, like I said, realize I'm not sharing my screen. So let me scare, share my screen. So let's just say that I'm on SPSS, I'm in the output. I can take this and copy, and I can just paste this to a Word document. Then I can get my um, output over to Microsoft Word. Now this looks pretty crappy, right? This is like spread across three pages. I wouldn't want to have it look like this. So what I do here to get it to fit all on one page is I'd come over here. I'd click on the output, then I'd right click. Okay, so I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna hit copy special. I'm gonna save it as an image. And then when I paste it to a Word document, it's still not really gonna look all that good, but it's gonna look better than what it looked originally. And it's gonna fit all on one page. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. So ideally what you want to do when you get your output and then you transfer this stuff over, you create a cross tab or you create any of these like, uh, you know, a frequency distribution on the graphs in SPSS, you just copy them. And like I said, if they're not fitting on the page, just do copy special, save as an image. This works for PCs. I don't believe it works for Macs and I don't have a Mac and I'm not very familiar with Macs. So I don't really know how to make it work exactly with Macs. But again, um, what you could do is like screenshot with the Mac, or let's just say that you're dealing with like a Mac or with the PC and you're still not able to figure this out. You can use like the snipping tool. And you can just do this. And you can save this and then just input that into the Word document. Okay. So. You know, hopefully people are at least kind of familiar with their own computers so that they can figure this type of stuff out. Um, so yeah, um, when you're doing this stuff and then you're transferring this stuff over to the Word document, you're typically just going to copy and paste the output. And then like I said, if it's not fitting, just do copy and special and save as an image. Good question. Anything else? Not from me right now. Like I said, I mean, the rest of the whole classes are counting on y'all to ask questions. So if y'all don't have any questions, I'm assuming nobody else is watching these videos either. 
I, I mean, if there's no questions, like I said, that's uh, the end of it. Uh, I will stop this recording. Like I said, I will send this to you all uh, later on. Um, good luck uh, completing that uh, homework, and I will see you all next week. Okay, thank you.